Hello. So good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me. I would like to thank the organizers for uh, putting up this session together. So I will be giving the, the first talk in this session on multiple scales in mathematical neuroscience. And so I will show this uh, work, uh, trying to understand this uh, whole brain network dynamics. Uh, we characterize this ghost attractors. So this is a joint uh, effort uh, from uh, people from maths and physics that are trying to understand brain activity. So I will give a, a brief introduction, trying to be as inclusive as possible to both people from neuroscience fields and also from uh, more uh, theoretical fields, especially in dynamical systems theory. And then I will show how we characterize whole brain network dynamics, how we identify these patterns and uh, discuss on their functional relevance. So let's start. So when we look at brain activity recorded with fMRI, we see that the brain uh, exhibits a complex dynamic behavior at a macroscopic scale. So here I will be always focusing on the macroscopic scale. So this signal is an indirect measure of uh, neural activity. It captures variations in magnetic susceptibility, supposedly linked to uh, hemodynamic response. Uh, but importantly, theoretical works have started to dig into this uh, activity and uh, try to find uh, proper works. And theoretical works indicate that the brain system operates in this critical regime. I will go into that. So several brands of neuroimaging analysis have applied component analysis, either PCA, ICA, clustering, hit and markup models on this fMRI data, and they consistently detect this formation of functionally relevant network patterns across large data sets, so for thousands of people, and consistently there are these networks called the visual networks, somatomotor, dorsal attention, ventral attention, limbic, and they each are related to specific cognitive functions. So from a physics perspective, looking at this system with this complex behavior with different patterns, we can an, interpret brain activity as a complex uh, adaptive system uh, that has a, a functional meaning. So our aim is to understand how this uh, structure, how the brain uh, exhibits, brain, generates brain function, right, from the interconnection between uh, 100 billion neurons connected by trillions of synapses. And so this network, this complex network, generates an infinity of activity patterns that coordinate behavior. So to understand this, we try to use this theory of dynamical systems to characterize brain network dynamics. So dynamical systems theory, for the ones who are, for some it may seem too obvious, but it aims to, to characterize uh, and to search for the fundamental rules that are governing the behavior of collective systems, of complex systems, uh, be they atoms, molecules, cells, or life forms, uh, that cannot be understood by the single unit alone. So when this whole system, this collective behavior, becomes more meaningful than the aggregate of its parts, it is referred to as a complex adaptive system. I have here a small cartoon to illustrate what this means. But there are many processes in nature that result from this coordinated interaction of dynamical units, where the ensemble engages in this functionally relevant collective behavior. One important feature of, uh, of these systems, of complex systems, is that they can exhibit multistability and criticality, which are key features in complex dynamical systems because they allow for an adaptive response of the whole system to a minimal change in one of its units, which is a very important feature that, uh, for brain function. So, Theoretical works have proposed over the last decade that these activity patterns forming in brain activity, these functional networks, uh, are the expression of recurrent excursions into weakly stable attractors. Uh, so this scenario is supported by brain network models that uh, use different type of reduction approaches, but that are able to exhibit uh, multi-stable and metastable dynamics. So there are multiple patterns that can exi ex exist and they are not stationary, they are not fully stable, they switch between patterns. But the thing is, despite these uh, theoretical insights, there is little evidence from the experimental side of how these networks are characterized. 
So it has only recently began to be explored, these dynamical features of the functional brain networks. So the idea is if we can characterize brain activity in a reduced state space uh, in the form of transitions between recurrent states. All right, so that is the main focus of what I will show next and the methodology. So one of the, the key things that we do, so when we have the, the fMRI signal, it's, we, it's a real signal, so we cannot analyze phase dynamics. So to, to analyze the phase, we use the Hilbert transform. So imagine this is the signal in the real domain, so we have the imaginary axis, so the, sig the signal is seen like a, 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 an oscillation, let's say, which has an instantaneous phase at each instant of time. So if we take the, the signal, in each uh, brain area and compute the phase at each instant of time, we can con con transform the bold signal into an analytic signal over time. So here, for example, is the figure. So we show that in each brain area, so we divide the brain into, for example, here is 90 different brain areas to reduce the dimensionality. This could be done at the voxel level, but with very high dimensionality. So we use, for example, just 90 brain areas, and then we compute the phase of the bold signal at each instant of time. And as we see, there can be some patterns, but they, they are constantly evolving over time. So to characterize these phase relationships between this bold signal, the, the fMRI signal is also called the bold signal, we, we developed a method in 2017 turned leading eigenvector dynamics analysis, where what we do is we compute the, um, the leading eigenvector of all both signal phases, so of all fMRI signal phases, and then we project the signal in each brain area into that eigenvector. So in, we change the reference system, okay? And uh, in this way here, we are coloring in the brain, the brain areas whose, whose phase projects in one direction to the leading eigenvector or in the opposite direction. So we can divide the, the phases into two uh, groups according to their uh, both phase orientation. And so what this gives us, so when we get the, the leading eigenvector, how it looks like, it, it's a vector with it where each element represents a brain area. And the values here on the right side, as we see, so it's the vector, the values represent how much the phase is projecting into the leading eigenvector. And so, until now, this seems a mathematical way, but so it is, uh, uh, as we, if we look into detail, for example, here at once given TR, we see that many bold C fMRI signal phases are going in one direction, and then some subsets of run areas uh, display a phase shift into the main orientation. So here would be the main orientation, and here we see some phases going in a almost perpendicular direction. So if we take at each TR, the leading eigenvector, we have a sequence of eigenvectors over time. We can then cluster them. We can look here, for example, how the, the, um, the eigenvectors look like when they are projected into the brain space. So on the left side, this uh, represents the bold phase coherence matrix. So it's a matrix of the cosine of the phase difference. And as we see, it's evolving over time and it appears very noisy. And on the right, we are coloring, we are I'm plotting links between the areas who are shifting their bold signal phase with respect to the main uh, dynamics. So it, it appears to have some strange network dynamics, but the idea is, are these network, this shapes that are forming these networks meaningful? Are they recurrent? So here again, if you look over time, this is an illustration of the whole pipeline. So if we have the both signal in the top panel over time, we have 1,200 time points from one single session, let's say. And then in panel C, this is how the phases, the, then in panel D, we see how they project into the, the, the brain. So we see that uh, the areas colored in red are projecting into the positive uh, direction of the leading eigenvector. And we, it seems to reveal some functionally meaningful subsystems. So now for each TR, we have one of these brains that we see here in panel D, and we are going to cluster them. So to understand which are the rules governing these patterns, let's say. So on the left panel here, each black dot represents a uh, bold uh, phase locking pattern, which is how we call it. So it's, it represents an eigenvector in a way. 
Uh, and so this is across 99 uh, subjects who were recorded uh, during rest, uh, so doing no specific task. And each participant was scanned twice on the same day. This will re be relevant for uh, future reports, uh, for future slides. So what we, we do here, we use the first session only. We, we represent all these dots uh, in this space. And then we cluster, we use a k-means partition to see if we can detect uh, different clusters in, in the activity. So for example, here we choose, uh, we, choose a, we vary the number of clusters that we want to use. Here is an illustration, we're using k equal five, so five subsystems. And we illustrate how the centroids look like. Okay. So the idea is, are these patterns uh, meaningful, the patterns that we detect with clustering? So in a way to see if they are uh, revealing a complex adaptive system. And so what we do is as we vary K from two to 20, so we divide the system into two to 20 networks, we see how much the, the patterns that are revealed by the living eigenvector, how much they overlap with reference functional brain networks from the literature. Like I said, with the visual, with the somatomotor, with the dorsal attention, the default mode network. So if we divide only with, with two, what we find is that we have a state that doesn't overlap with any functional network. So all those single phase are going in the same direction. And there's a second state where we see the default mode network. And then as we increase the number of K, we see more and more functionally relevant states that come out as, uh, as clusters, as centroids in the system. So our data, our approach is revealing functionally relevant systems. And we use here the, just for illustration on this work, we use the solution with k equal five. So with five states where we have a number of really meaningful uh, systems that are known to characterize brain function, namely the frontal parietal network, the DMN, the fault mode network, and the visual and the somatomotor. We computed the silhouette value to see what, which is the best number of clusters that would represent this, this so we chose k equal five, and here is, for example, this is the overlap. So it's really significant, the overlap with these reference systems. So with uh, very high significance. So now how do, what do these uh, networks mean? So in the first one, the states, the, so here they are sorted according to probability of occurrence. The first state that we detect, all those signals go in the same direction. So all the phases are going in the same direction. In the second state, we see that some areas that compose the, func the default mode network, here plotted in red as arrows, they shift their both signal with respect to the rest of the brain. So they form a functional network that really overlaps with the DMN. So at the bottom plot, we see that each system overlaps with different brain functional systems, especially the last one overlaps with two due to the reduced number of states that we use. Okay. So this is how the, the correlation matrix looks over time in panel B at the bottom, which we can compute by simply using the, the outer product of the eigenvector. So just to see how it would look like in matrix format, because many people in neuroimaging community analyze this, uh, these matrices. But importantly, what we want to illustrate here is that we can really visualize and see these different patterns of connectivity in the different states. Now, the question is, do these patterns occur in all subjects and do they reoccur in the second same day session? So to characterize these networks and to see how reliable the measures are, we compute some measures from uh, dynamical systems theory, namely the fractional occupancy, which is how many time points are assigned to a given state over time. So if we have the both signal over time here as an illustration, Basically, the fractional occupancy is the number of time points where this blue state, for example, a given state is active. So this proportion of, uh, of time points uh, seems to be a reliable measure. Another measure is the dwell time, which is once the system is active, that network is active, how long does it last? So how many consecutive points, time points are assigned to a given cluster? So when we compute these two measures, the fractional occupancy and the dwell time in the bottom. We compute this for each single subject over time. And we compute this for the two fMRI sessions. So this is called right-left session and left-right session because it uh, depends on how the bull signal was recorded, the sequence of acquisition. 
But mainly, importantly, what we wanted to show here, so this is the line, so there is, uh, especially in the occurrence of the global, system, the global signal, uh, there seems to be within subject reliability. So the same subject in the two sessions, the two separate sessions in the same day, has the same probability or a similar probability of expressing uh, this pattern of activity. Uh, regarding the remaining uh, states, we still see some, uh, some reliability, but above all, all of them exhibit these patterns. And, um, and regarding the dwell times, which is the time the states last, we used unfiltered data. So what we find is that these states are really short-lived, the, these functionally meaningful states. So they last for one to two TRs, so uh, two seconds more or less on average. So they are short-lived, but they are recurrent. And then to characterize the dynamics between states, we use uh, what is called Markov chains. So it's basically just taking into account the probability of switching from one state to the other. And uh, we divide, to use the Markov chain transition probability matrix, we divide by the probability of occurrence of that state. So using this approach, we can compute this average transition probability matrix across all the, 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 the participants. And what we found was uh, particularly interesting and corroborates previous ideas of this idea of multistability and ghost attractors. So we found that the state one, where all both signals are aligned, is the most recurrent one. So it lasts, and once we land into this state, there is 77% probability of remaining in this state. But then from time to time, like with 8% probability or 5%, there is a probability of switching to another state, to these functionally relevant patterns. And when it engages in these patterns, there is around 50 40 to 50 percent probability of remaining in these states and then returning back to, to the global state. So we see here that the first column, which represents in the matrix, which represents the probability of returning back to state one, is significantly higher than the probability of switching to other states. So from this, we can draw a, a theoretical uh, scenario where we have the, the global baseline synchronized state is the main attractor. Okay, and the other states that are weakly stable, so they last shortly, but they are recurrent, are termed ghost attractors. So we, we evaluated the, reli the reliability of these measures uh, across subjects using intra-class correlation, which is uh, merging, uh, putting the mean squared error within subjects divided the between subject mean squared error. And so, we find that in particular for state one uh, is where we observe the higher reliability, uh, but also we find that we have much higher reliability when we consider the fractional occupancy than the dwell time, because probably we don't have enough temporal resolution with the fMRI signal uh, to detect really the occurrence, the short-lived occurrence of these states. Okay. And so this, uh, this work was recently published uh, in uh, Frontiers in Systems Neuroscience, it was worked by a PhD student, Jakob Orisek. But uh, the method itself was introduced uh, in 2017 in a data set from uh, healthy older adults. And uh, over time, we have applied this method to different, uh, to different studies for a data set with people with major depressive disorder or another data set where people were taking psilocybin or another data set to use for modeling work, comparing wakefulness and sleep. Uh, another where we use this in a task paradigm to evaluate uh, learned infant emotionality. And the, the main thing with this is that we are consistently finding results that can give us insight on brain function. So this approach, this mathematical framework of projecting back into the living eigenvector and clustering these systems and analyzing from this perspective is revealing meaningful results that are useful for the fields of psychopathology, for therapeutics, for, and for psychophysiology in general, to understand how the brain is working, the psyche. So as uh, overall, uh, why this is important, so, so far we found across these works that the states of fMRI phase locking are recurrent, they are meaningful, and they are reliable. 
And importantly, they can be modulated. They are changed. The probability of occurrence of these states changes with task, with psychiatric condition, with mood, with psychoactive compounds, with visual, auditory or electric stimulation, and also with performance of the participants. Patterns that we still don't understand why uh, a theoretical uh, conference the, to raise this uh, so called million dollar question because I see many mathematical models are exploring this. That one of the key essential features to advance in the field of neuroimaging is to understand what are the biophysical mechanisms behind this self organizing pattern formation, which I believe is probably linked to chimera states or to synchronization phenomena in general. So I would like to thank my, my network and funding with special acknowledgement to the contributors of this paper, uh, but also the whole group uh, in Braga in Portugal, in Oxford, and also the group in Barcelona where I did my PhD and the uh, funding agencies that have supported me. Okay, thank you. Thank you, jo Joana, for a great talk. Um, let's jump into the Q&A question. We have uh, three questions for you. Um, the first question from Pete Ashwin um, says, thanks. Can you say something about the distributions of dwell times, not just the mean dwell times? Are they what you would expect from Markov? Uh, okay, that is a very relevant question indeed to fully understand the, the dynamics of what is happening. The dwell times would be really important. What we found here was that the dwell time of these uh, functionally relevant networks was very close to the acquisition time, to the TR it's called, the repetition time in fMRI. So, and, and there is a slight timing correction algorithm. There are some artifact removal artifacts that just average across consecutive time points. So it's possible that when we detect the same network occurring twice uh, in two consecutive time points, it may not be, um, it may be an artifact. So from my perspective, I think to really characterize the dwell times and to find meaningful uh, results in the dwell times, we would need to advance in the temporal resolution of fMRI. So here we had one point every 700 milliseconds. So almost one second per point. And MEG studies point that the formation of these network states of these functional states are uh, occurring at 200 milliseconds. So it could be that we are just capturing these states by chance in the fMRI scanner, but the characterization of the dwell time so far hasn't revealed really meaningful results. Most of the meaningful results from psychopathology, for example, in OCD or depression, we, we find better results using the fractional occupancy. So just a probabilistic framework. So we have the probability of detecting more of these networks, but characterize their time is yet, uh, I think we have to, it's limited by technolo technology. Thank you. Uh, one more short question. Um, there's one question from Sophie Benitez. As far as I understood, your approach applies uh, the eigenvector decomposition to the bold signal. There are also some papers applying the eigenvector decomposition to the structural connectivity of the brain. And I was wondering if you had an opinion on how these two eigenspaces are related conceptually. Hi, Sophie. This is a very interesting point. So in the first 2017 paper, uh, I, I analyzed, I think in figure two, uh, how much, so I computed also the eigenvectors of the structural connectivity matrix to see if these patterns that we are observing would re represent directly the, these, uh, these uh, states. There isn't a one-to-one -one match because probably this, uh, the eigenvectors of the structural connectivity are not capturing the full uh, the full nonlinear interactions, and in particular, they don't capture the time delays between brain areas. So there is here, uh, so to have, uh, we are investigating this, what is the, the source of this, uh, these patterns? We try to relate to this connectome harmonics because you can either do the eigenvectors of the structural connectivity or the Laplace eigenvectors of the structural connectivity. But so far, there isn't a one-to-one -one match. So we can project one to the others and see how much they relate. There is a slight relationship, 
but uh, I think we need methods that incorporate as well the, the time delay, so the space-time structure of the brain, not just the connectivity structure. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a way of further research trying to understand, it. we are on it, to be honest, we are on it, trying to understand this link. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Joan.